So at UCLA, our work in this field is also supported by the University of California's Global Food Initiative and the UCLA Healthy Campus Initiative. So we have two initiatives coming together in very catalytic ways, which really builds excitement on this campus. Both programs are from, uh, aimed at improving health, wellness, and food security through outreach and interdisciplinary research. So today, I'm honored to introduce two brilliant leaders who are key in implementing these important initiatives. Throughout her distinguished career, Janet Napolitano has, devoted, has been devoted to public service. She's been president of the University of California since 2013. Before that, she served as U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security, as Governor of Arizona, as the state's Attorney General, and U.S. Attorney. So she's had a huge commitment to public service for really her entire life. Now as head of one of uh, the world's top public research institutions, President Napolitano works across disciplines, campuses, and sectors to make an impact on California and beyond. This is a really large operation when you think about 10 campuses. This campus alone is one of the biggest campuses in, in the country, so uh, being president of this organization is, is an extraordinary undertaking. So joining President Napolitano in discussion is UCLA's Associate Vice Provost for our Healthy Campus Initiative, Wendy Slusser. Uh, Dr. Slusser leads our effort to make UCLA the healthiest campus in America. Small goal, healthiest campus in America. <laughs> The initiative was founded and supported by philanthropists Jane and Terry Semmel five years ago, and we're grateful for their vision, and Jane is actually joining us today, and thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Already, the Healthy Campus Initiative has inspired other campuses to follow suit, copycat, which is perfect, and launch similar programs of their own with their own dimensions that are really adding to our knowledge, too, of what is possible. So please join me in welcoming Janet Napolitano and Wendy Slusser for today's discussion. Thank you. It's the statewide agriculture and natural resources program, which is a vestige of the fact that we're the land grant university uh, for California. And you know, a big part of our mission is research, and a big part of our mission is education, and a third big part of our mission is public service. And we believe as a system that we can kind of unite forces, we call it the power of 10. Uh, to really take on some of the world's challenges. And in discussion with uh, the chancellors, uh, we got to the topic of food, and um, uh, that food was a global challenge that it crossed many different di disciplines, that it, it, it crossed uh, directly into student life, uh, and that this would be an area where we could uh, unite researchers, students across the campuses. Um, and so we formed the Global Food Initiative. And 
Uh, its mission is, uh, it's very modest. It's to put the world on a pathway to a sustainable, nutritious food future. Uh, and uh, it's guided by the data point that, you know, by, by 2025, there will be 8 billion people in the world. Uh, and so under the aegis of the Global Food Initiative, um, we have uh, a lot of multi-campus research projects underway. Uh, we fund food fellows, um, students who are doing research uh, in any of the disciplines related to food, and there have been literally hundreds of food fellows by now, um, and uh, really trying to contribute uh, in innovative and scalable ways to uh, the food future of the planet. Fantastic. What do you think was, is one of the sentinel projects that you feel most proud of related to the Global Food Initiative? Well, there, there, are, there are many. Um, some have to deal with uh, the development of new types of crops. Uh, um, for example, uh, a type of rice that can be grown um, in flood conditions. Um, others have to do with new techniques of agriculture or practicing agriculture in areas of drought. Others have to do uh, with projects related to uh, food security on the campuses. And you know that, that has been a concern of our students and I think probably your students uh, for several years. Um, and under the, the Global Food Initiative, we've been supporting a lot of projects uh, dealing with uh, the food security issue among our students. And that, that's something that you've really put a lot of uh, effort into. And what would you say for all of the campuses here, and it's been something that's been brought up to the high, you know, it's been brought into the um, newspaper world, but many of us have known food insecurity or at least starving student students were around for a long time. What have you done that has been um, important in this area? Well, one is simply funding. Uh, so we've we've put... Uh, I think uh, by now at least $4 million into supporting uh, food pantries on, on the campuses. Uh, supporting programs uh, where uh, we can give students uh, swipes of uh, menu cards in the dining halls. Um, uh, supporting vouchers at local grocery stores. Providing transportation to grocery stores. Um, and then uh, providing uh, uh, instruction on how to, uh, how to how to shop, you know, how to prepare healthy food, uh, you know, what goes into a healthy diet, uh, and those are increasingly popular. I think your combining food insecurity with food literacy has been a real unique uh, strategy towards dealing with this issue, and I know that some of the uh, students here in our Global Food Initiative Fellowship have worked towards that and have been so appreciative. It's, I think, a unique contribution that you've made to bring in the students into solving these challenges. Right. And, and you know, it's a student problem, a student issue, uh, and students can help address it yeah. and, and uh, uh, suggest helpful strategies for that. So we have found their input very valuable. Yeah. And so leading into that, the students in general, what do you think the Global Food Initiative plays within the framework of educational efforts, maybe even outside of a university, for instance, working with uh, entities like corporations or even menus for research collaborative. How do you see uh, Global Food Initiative integrating into these uh, kinds of other entities? Well, I think um, uh, the menus of change, um, I keep wanting to say menus for change, but it's menus <laughs> no, of change. I do too. Um, uh, you know, this is the kind of uh, uh, group that there should be a linkage with uh, the Global Food Initiative. Um, and we should be um, forcing ourselves uh, to have a bold mission and to unite forces on how to achieve that mission. Um, and uh, combine uh, the research that's done with effective policy that we can then implement. That's both innovative and, and I keep emphasizing the word scalable. Um, uh, that we go from pilot projects to say a whole campus to a whole system um, uh, or indeed from a whole system to a state to a nation. So 
Um, uh, so thinking together about, uh, you know, w what are the real connections where food is concerned, uh, and that should be research-based, uh, and then developing policy around that and, and implementation plans. Um, it seems to me that uh, uh, menus of change uh, and the GFI have a, have a natural linkage in this regard. Yeah. Yeah, and I was talking to Janet er earlier today and just complimenting her on the Global Food Initiative and how it has really connected all the UC campuses and really leveraging all the different talents on the different campuses. And I see the menus of change doing the same kind of work across uh, the country. And um, one of the things I think has been particularly in innovative, too, with the Global Food Initiative is that you've launched now a healthy campus network which um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how you've now integrating other forms of health and well-being in addition to food into the Global Food Initiative and what's the purpose of this network? So the Healthy Campus Network is actually uh, the outgrowth of the Healthy Campus Initiative that was begun here at UCLA um, with the support of uh, and the ideas of Terry and, and Jane Semmel. Um, and um, it's, uh, you know, based on uh, uh, the premise uh, that our students need to, to learn how to lead a healthy lifestyle. And that's not just in terms of diet, but it's in terms of physical health, mental health, social health, social well-being, um, you know, how they interact um, amongst themselves uh, within the community, how they take care of what we can think of as their brain health, um, which uh, all emanates and is related to their physical health, which of course is related to their, their food and their diet. So all of these things now are um, interconnected. And so uh, with the Healthy uh, Campus Network, uh, um, implementing programs that expand beyond food, food is kind of the hub of the wheel, right? Mm -hmm. and all of these things kind of spoke out of it. And uh, so there are um, uh, activities underway at each of our campuses um, as part of the Healthy Campus Network. Yeah. I love that idea about food being the nexus for health and well-being. It's so true, right? The meal, having a meal together can just illustrate everything that you just said. So I, I love that. I'm sure others here who are all involved in food would agree. Um, so um, moving on, I, I want to sort of reflect on the fact that you've been the president of the United, you know, United States. <laughs> I wish. <No>. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you've been the president of the University of California since 2013. And um, you've had such a distinguished career that Chancellor Block mentioned. Uh, and I'd just like to say, in fact, I was looking into your bio preparing for today, and you have been the first woman in so many positions that you've held, including starting at Santa Clara. You were the first wo uh, woman who was the um, valedictorian. You were the first woman as the Attorney General of Arizona, Chair of the National Governors Association, Secretary of Homeland Security, and president of the University of California, the first woman for all those things. And I'd love to know, how did those previous roles prepare you to serve as president of the UCs? <laughs> you know, how does being uh, uh, Secretary of Homeland Security prepare you for anything? Um, uh, um, you know, I think, um, you know, being the first woman is almost, is almost a, a a factor of timing. There were many women who went before me, and you know we all stand on the shoulders of our predecessors. So the the pathway had already been been uh, been laid. Um, uh, you know the the University of California is a big, complicated organization. You know our annual budget is about 31 billion uh, a year, um, and. Uh, that, which is roughly three times the budget of the state of Arizona. Uh, if we were a state, we'd be probably, in terms of budget, we'd be probably in, you know, somewhere between rank number 16 and number 20. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a huge operation. Nonetheless, um, 
between running a state and uh, running a large federal agency, a, a complicated one like DHS. I mean, there there are lessons learned that um, you take to uh, the university. You know, all large organizations. You know, you have budgets, uh, you're dealing with legislatures, you're dealing with the media, you're dealing with different stakeholders. Um, and so, you know, you, you kind of learn as you go. Um, but, you know, whatever skill set I had from those prior positions, I moved to the university. But the university is a different type of organization. Uh, the, the, a key difference is uh, at the University of California, we have shared governance, um, and shared governance with the faculty. It's part of the DNA of the place. Uh, so um, learning about and incorporating the theory of shared governance um, uh, was, was new to me. And um, uh, when, I, when I took over, I was like, shared governance, what's that? Um, uh, but, you, but you learn as you go along, and, and you come to respect it. Well, and so many of us here are leaders of our own organizations. How would you describe your leadership style or philosophy, and why would you think it has worked so well for you over the years? You know, I, I, you know, I, I, I think there's a difference between leadership and management, and um, I think that uh, it's incumbent on the leader to. Uh, to set a vision, to establish uh, larger uh, goals, um, and to bring people along and persuade them that um, uh, they are part of an organization, that they have uh, a unity of effort, that a, a unity of mission. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's a challenge at a university where you've got so many different campuses spread out over a large area. It was a challenge at uh, uh, DHS, which was made up of what previously had been 23 different federal agencies that were all pulled together to form this new department in the wake of 9-11 and had a very broad mission space. Um, and um, it, it, even in running a state, um, uh, uh, you have people spread out all over and um, uh, who, who, who are focused on their job and their role. And I think part of the leader's job is to make them see how their job and their role fits into the greater whole. And how, um, uh, say, at a university, everybody from uh, a groundskeeper to uh, a tenured professor to a dean um, uh, all have a role to play in the successful execution of, of the mission which is the education, the research, and the public service. That sounds like a great recipe, right? <laughs> you need the baking soda, you need the salt, you need the flour, right? And, right, right. And delicious butter. So. <laughs> exactly. Um, Wendy just introduced me to Irish butter, by the way, which I've, 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 I've never heard inside. of. But. Um, is there a particular leader who inspires you um, and why? You know, I think, uh, you know, I've had the, the privilege of working with some uh, uh, terrific leaders and mentors. Um, and, and I think mentorship is, is important. So uh, my first job out of law school, uh, I clerked for uh, a federal judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, and she became uh, the, their first um, uh, woman judge, wow. chief judge. Um, and was able to um, watch her leadership style. Um, and if you think leading, uh, leading a university with faculty is difficult, try leading a court occupied by judges, all of whom have life tenure. Wow. Um, uh, so, you know, and she had to, you know, bring, bring, them, bring them along. Uh, I was at a law firm for, for 10 years, and the senior partner there was a, a remarkable leader in his own way. He was a very unique guy. Um, uh, I was practicing in Phoenix. Um, uh, this man had been a professor at Yale Law School, and then he had asthma, so he had to go to a climate that, that could accommodate the asthma, so he moved to Arizona. Um, and. Uh, um, had handled some big uh, legal cases, so he um, handled the Miranda case. Um, uh, is Miranda versus Arizona, and Miranda was a 
pro bono client of our law firms. And uh, some of the lawyers at our firm actually, you know how police officers carry a wallet card with a Miranda warning on it that they can pull out and read? So they had Miranda cards autographed by Ernesto Miranda, wow. which is <laughs> like one of the great law souvenirs you can have. Um, but he, he was an effective leader, uh, uh, and he was leading a bunch of lawyers, um, also a difficult constituency. Um, and then uh, I had, you know, the honor of, of being in President Obama's cabinet. And uh, not only were my uh, were, were there some great leaders amongst my colleagues in the cabinet, but um, the president himself, uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, setting a vision and um, you know, doing the work necessary to execute on that um, uh, and, and bringing together uh, uh, disparate groups. Um, uh, he, he was a remarkable leader. So I've, I've, uh, the point is, is that I've had the opportunity throughout my career to work uh, with and for people that were uh, in their, each different styles, but each di very effective leaders. Uh -huh. It's interesting, too. It sounds like you were very observant of the leaders and so were, was able to pick up some of their attributes and move along. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and so they were great teachers as well. Uh -huh. Which it sounds like an important component of being a mentor as well, right? Mm -hmm. And that seemed to be a combined role to mentor leadership. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Interesting. Um, okay, so since this conference focuses in a large part on food, I have to ask you, what is your favorite food besides my cookies? And uh, when and where did you eat it last? <laughs> well, um, again, I'll, 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 my favorite meal is, uh, I'll just confess it right here, it, it's spaghetti and meatballs. Um, <laughs> right and, <laughs> uh, you know, just a really good plate of spaghetti and meatballs. Mm -hmm. um, but I love a fresh peach, right? You know, those summer stone fruits are so good. And I had a great one yesterday. Mm. Those both are pretty good choices. I would go with those too. Yeah. Uh, so finally, for us all here in this room, um, what specific calls of act to action would you offer all of us that we should take on on our campuses or in our lives or in our country? You know, I think since uh, um, you, you all are university-based, um, I, I hope you leave this conference uh, thinking about how we incorporate um, uh, elements of health. And when I say health, I mean physical, I mean mental, I mean social. Um, into uh, the next generation, um, uh, our students. Um, you know, what programs are effective? How do we incentivize our students? Um, and, uh, you know, how do we uh, uh, establish metrics of success? Um, and then uh, uh, a second thing I would encourage us all to do um, is to continue to uh, uh, and I'll use a cliche phrase, um, but it captures it, which is, you know, think outside the box. Um, uh, 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 try to be creative and innovative. And uh, again, I, I, I need to mention that word scalable. Um, uh, but uh, really uh, challenging yourselves. And, you know, maybe you set up uh, a little in, internal competition, uh, a little uh, internal grant fund or something like that um, uh, for uh, something uh, or programs or ideas that are very novel um, that um, can be tried on a campus and that can potentially cover at least the campuses that are represented in this group. So um, just an idea. That's fantastic. Sounds like some doable as well, mm -hmm. which I think um, we're all prepared to do. Many of the people in this room are operators, researchers, and they're combining their forces together to really be able to do some of these uh, innovations that you're describing. That's great. Yeah. I, I, I applaud you. I encourage you. 
if I had a lot of money, I would incentivize you. <laughs> um, but uh, keep on doing what we're doing. And then let's keep thinking about linkages between this group and the Global Food Initiative. Yeah. That's fantastic. I mean, um, Janet gave a speech uh, that I read about, you gave it in um, late August, the American Political Science Association, and you said educators must counter falsehood, falsehoods by shining lights, light on facts. And that, to me, is what we're doing here in the Menus of Change, is really bringing facts um, through research, and then, as you put it, put it, those facts and research can then lead to policy and change. Um, fantastic. So now we're going to take some questions from the audience. Um, and OK. So let's see. First question. So we decided to get you to write on index cards. So if you still have more questions, please go ahead. Uh, but this question is, what is your perspective on how issues of scale affect food and sustainability issues? For instance, how do you identify global solutions when food and sustainability issues are hyper-local? Right. So there, there, they're both hyper-local and global. Uh, and so um, you can think about uh, uh, you know, food production in a local way uh, with a local supply chain to a local market. Um, but uh, uh, addressing those issues um, has to be done uh, within uh, uh, the, the context that this is a global issue, in other words, connecting food production to supply chain to local markets is uh, something that has to be confronted um, in many nations across the world. Um, and techniques that may work in one place may not work in another, but they may. So um, being able to um, research and share uh, what really works in that environment, I think, is part of the the kind of research that we support with the GFI and uh, perhaps this group can support as well. Fantastic. Other thing that you've done, which I think is quite remarkable, is that you've joined a lot of the carbon neutrality work that you're doing through UC. And I mean, you have one of the biggest solar farms and in, in for a university. And so another, you know, in addition to the Global Food Initiative, we have the uh, the Carbon Neutrality Initiative, which is that, and it too has a big goal, which is that the university and all of its parts will be carbon neutral by the year 2025. Um, and, uh, you know, that requires a real commitment. Um, and part of that commitment is uh, uh, supplying more of our energy through renewable sources. So we made the largest uh, solar farm purchase of any university uh, in the country. It's out near Fresno, California, um, to help uh, supply uh, energy to our campuses. So it's really, I mean, it's a real twin goal or even trifecta when you add the water in there. But, you know, we're really linking food, energy, water, um, and um, making a better place for all of us because doing it locally will ultimately be a global solution. Indeed. Right. Yeah. So how can we better connect academic researchers, chefs, and dining directors to help them help uh, benefit or solve the global demand curve towards healthy, sustainable food choices? So that, um, uh, the, the question, uh, it goes both to how do you locally connect researchers with the dining hall operators and the chefs? Uh, and um, I, I think that needs to be facilitated at, a, at the campus level. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you, there's nothing that prevents uh, uh, other campuses or universities uh, from having something like uh, a global food initiative. Um, under which Aegis you can uh, uh, sponsor, uh, uh, you can sponsor convenings, you can sponsor meetings, et cetera, where you bring together researchers and chefs and dining hall operators and procurement officers. Uh, but let's not forget the role of procurement in this whole thing. 
Um, and uh, again, uh, through doing that, uh, uh, develop tactics uh, and strategies uh, that can be scalable and used in other settings. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think uh, part of what we do at the Global Food Initiative is very local, i.e. it's campus-based, uh, but a large part of it is also thinking globally about food supply, how food is produced, how it moves to market, um, what are the, some of the cultural issues affecting food, um, uh, education, and how do we educate the next generation about uh, uh, food. So, um, you know, the, um, these are all linked together, as, as this group well knows. Yeah. That's really how you've designed the Global Food Initiative. What was really brilliant was that you looked at educator, you looked at education, policy, service, research, and operators, and pulled all, you know, identified the assets on all the different campuses and brought them together. And I think that joining all those different disciplines together is what's going to solve and uh, resolve some of the challenges that we have globally. Indeed. Yeah. Yep. How do you grow and support um, leaders in your organization? Um, well, I think, uh, uh, you know, the, um, the campuses um, uh, all have uh, their own leadership. So, um, and, they, and, and so I think the number one thing I can do is support the chancellors. Because uh, the chancellors are responsible for what happens on on the campus, um, you know, within the office of uh, the president, and we run a lot of system wide operations. Um, like we handle uh, a large part of admissions. Um, we handle uh, uh, labor relations. Uh, we handle um, uh, the budget vis a vis the legislature. Um, we're the interface with the, the Board of Regents. Um, and so, uh, you know, within our organization, what I try to do is, is hire really good people as my direct reports. Um, and then um, to support mentorship uh, activities uh, for those who are lower down in the organization. Uh, because once we hire someone, um, uh, we want them to think about spending their career at the University of California. So to do that, they need to be able to see progress. They need to be able to see steps uh, that they can take. And so one of the things we are trying to make better, because I, I would say we're far from perfect here, um, is, is to make sure that our employees have a real career track. Um, and uh, that um, they know what other opportunities there are for them in the university. Yeah. Well, I can attest to your um, chiefs of staffs. They're amazing, so really wonderful people. Uh, okay, this is actually from one of your GFI fellows. Um, what are you most looking forward to in this next year in terms of the UC system making strides and innovations to redesigning our world's food system? Um, well, I'm, I, I always look forward to hearing about the research that the Food Fellows are doing. Um, and so, uh, you know, part of me wants to, to not answer that question until <laughs> I, I, I see what, what research has uh, been producing. Um, you know, one of the, the uh, I talked about uh, uh, procurement a minute ago, and uh, one of the things we want to do is make sure as a university that we are um, uh, produ or, um, uh, procuring a certain amount of the food that we use from small growers, from small farmers in, in California. Um, and so I really want to make sure we're strengthening uh, those linkages. And then for larger procurements, uh, uh, we want to, uh, and are working with the Cal State University system uh, to see if we can actually unite uh, some of our procurements and use that that benefit of, of size and scale, that leverage, um, because uh, you know part of this is is healthy food, but it also has to be affordable food, and so you know squaring that circle is uh, a challenge that we have to confront. Yeah. And that's been one of your GFI um, projects was to create 
food hubs for the farmers, smaller farmers, which has been a great example. And for those of you who are interested in it in other parts of the country, um, that was generated by UC Davis, fantastic uh, project that um, GFI supported mm -hmm. and has created some s toolkits. Um, so in the UC system, we also participate in the UC Sustainable, Sustainable Food Service Working Group. How can we align the goals and initiatives of GFI, UCSF's working group, and the MOC, I'm not sure what that is, uh, what's that? Oh, man, use of change, uh, to avoid duplicating efforts? Um, well, you know, all duplication is not bad. Uh, uh, you know, um, it's unnecessary duplication that um, uh, you need to watch out for. And um, uh, if uh, you have different groups um, all, f all focused on looking at the same problem, that doesn't necessarily bother me. In fact, putting mass on target um, uh, can really help forward uh, an agenda. Um, but I do think our different groups should be in touch and learning from one another uh, and, um, uh, uh, and making sure that we are um, taking the best advantage of the research results that um, are obtained um, and really thinking through how we move from uh, research to policy to implementation. Yeah, yeah I think that's the real um, secret ingredient to GFI, to MOC, to other act healthy campus initiatives. This translation of research to operation mm -hmm. is really uh, a unique um, opportunity for campuses and universities. Um, okay, I think we have a couple, one more minute. Um, let's see. It's a long one, but I'll try. Oh, <laughs> fire away. The well being of international students is very heavy, heavily linked to emotional well being. That can be positively supported by food. A lot of principles of menus of change are easily represented in such ethnic auth um, authenticity. Are there any examples that you've witnessed or have initiated that the members here could like could replicate? Well, I think UCLA has some uh, uh, um, with uh, different um, uh, ethnic foods represented in some of the dining halls here. So maybe you're the best person to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think there yeah. are some examples here in yeah. Bruin land. Yes. <laughs> That's true, and I think Pete will be uh, sharing some of that information. So maybe we have one more. We can ask, ask the last question then. So everyone's gotten their questions answered. Um, so can you share any best practices for gaining university leaders um, buy-in in dining, dining's role in campus health and wellness? Like, I guess, getting um, dining's role integrated into campus health and wellness. Um, well, I, you know, I... Uh, you know, I, I would um, begin by uh, uh, um, clearly defining uh, what uh, dining dining's role is, um, and then uh, uh, going to see your campus, you know, your president or your chancellor, whatever they're called, um, and uh, uh, go with go to him or her with a suggested plan uh, of, of how you want to proceed who needs to be incorporated, and why it's in the university's best interest to support this activity. Um, and I think you'll get a good response. I think that university leaders around the country are looking for ways to make positive, uh, good change in the lives of their students. And to me, um, uh, starting with uh, uh, the food as, as kind of, again, the, the hub of a wheel out of which many spokes come, uh, is a good place to start. And this is a great um, question to end with because I think also having leadership like President Napolitano and our Chancellor Block and all our other leaders on our campus, having them be true believers in the fact that the determinants of success at the workplace and also in the, in the classroom is related to our health and well-being, right? My dad used to say, you, you know, your health is number one, and that is, is the truth. And so um, it's a real pleasure and honor that you came here to speak to us. It is a testimony to your commitment to this effort of ours, of all of ours, of creating um, 
you know, a health and well-being environment where people are learning, researching, studying, you know, living every day. So thank you so much, and um, we expect you back here again when, one day sooner than later. There so. you go. Thank you all very much. Thank you.